Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 13th live stream of the Music Hack Space. And today we are welcoming Amy Dickens. Hello, Amy. Hi. So we are both based in London. Um, Amy is uh, an audio engineer by trade, but recently she got involved into research in accessibility and especially for music. And we're very happy to have her. Coincidentally, today is Global Awareness uh, Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Uh, when we chatted first, we didn't know that it would coincide, but it's a very good coincidence, and we're very happy to, to celebrate that as well. Um, what does it mean to you to have like a day dedicated to accessibility? Well, it's really just uh, a, it's a great way to get people, a, well, to raise awareness about the subject in general. Uh, accessibility is a very hot topic right now, purely because there's been this huge transition to being online for most of our things. So access to everything is is hard to achieve for everybody. And there is like an inequality in experience for sure. So at this moment in time, I can't think of a of a better cause to be like having a an international worldwide day for to say, hey, accessibility of things, we're still not there and we need to think about it. And if you're interested, here's a load of materials and content that you can go look at and find out about. So we, we do hear a lot about accessibility in IT and digital. Um, and, and most often it refers to visual uh, support, uh, but, but there's plenty of other ways in which we, we need to, to help to, to make um, devices in particular, and in particular the case of music, more accessible. What, what is your, your experience with, with those other ways of, of working with uh, accessible uh, people, people who need accessibility? So, yeah, we're going to cover quite a lot in today's talk about the different different experiences I've had throughout my research. But there is definitely uh, there is a lot of approaches that try to be a bit one size fits all. And that doesn't work with accessibility requirements necessarily. Uh, generally, uh, and I've talked about this in inclusivity talks as well, is to try and approach like the highest or most oppressed requirements that you that you can so that you're making things more accessible for everybody else along the way. Because if you're prioritizing somebody with the highest needs, you'll generally end up in a direction where you've solved a lot of problems for people with lower level needs or people with temporary disability or people who have just, you know, a limited accessibility for a short period of time. I see. Um, I have just one last, uh, maybe more, more of a comment than a question, but um, I, I think for many people uh, who are developing commercial products, you know, accessibility doesn't come in the in the specification document they're given. And, <laughs> and so often it's an afterthought, but surely there are commercial reasons as well to actually do things that are accessible. And wow. I'm, I'm sure you'll talk about this, but it'd be great to imprint that as well on, on, on people who listen today that actually they should consider it just because it's also a good idea for business. Yes, and that is one of the things I'm gonna touch on uh, quite heavily as to, to why it's so important for business. And also some of the considerations and, and pushback that I found from different organizations and community groups and, you know, what people usually say is, oh, well, we just, we've never had somebody ask for that. So we've never really thought about it. And, and like ways that you could combat that or at least talk about it within your product development team as well. Or if you're an artist, think about ways that you can incorporate better practices so that you are thinking about those things in future. Great. Well, I'm going to bring up your slides and disappear. I just want to also say hello to everyone who, who joined us. Laura, uh, Edward, Marek, thank you for joining. And uh, please ask questions as well in the chat. Um, Amy will be able to see that and answer either during during the talk or after. And stay after. We'll have some Q&A and a special um, homework assignment for you towards the end. Um, really nice like that. All right. <laughs> Over to you, Amy. I'm removing myself. Okay. Right. So hello, everybody. Yep. Today, I'm going to talk to you about inclusive design in digital musical instruments. And when I'm talking about this, I'm trying to go from the viewpoint of making music accessible to everybody that wants to make music. Um, my name is Amy Dickens, and uh, you can find me on all of the social media at the Red Rocks Projects, or that way, even. Um, 
if you want to follow me, um, most of my stuff is there. And as Jamie said, today actually really nicely coincided. Uh, it's Global Accessibility Awareness Day. And if you did want to see some of the stuff that's been put out there for Global Accessibility Awareness Day, the best thing that you can do is go to social media and have a look at the hashtag GAAD2020. Um, there will be lots of great content shared across the web today. I know that there's organizations in the UK and the government are doing things. So there's there's different things that are happening um, and events that are happening across the globe right now. And the I suppose the nice thing about the current situation is all of those will be captured digitally somehow for you to play back at your own time. So uh, even if they're happening right now, you'll still be able to catch in. Um, if you're much better at multitasking than me, feel free to open another window and be looking at those hashtags right now. Um, but I do urge you just to check out some of the great content that will be there. So let's start with a little bit about me and why I'm going to talk to you today about this uh, specifically, uh, the specific subject of accessibility in digital musical instruments, which is quite a, quite a niche part of the, the world. Uh, firstly, before I go ahead, uh, I'm going to do an audio description of myself for anybody that requires it. I'm a white woman in her very early 30s. I actually turned 30 this month. I have uh, mid-length brown hair that turns to an orange color at the ends and a shaved undercut. Today, I'm actually wearing my hair in, the, in bunches either side of my head. I wear glasses and I'm wearing a black top with a very bright pink cardigan over the top because I felt summery today because it's quite hot in London. Um, I also want to advise that the, the, there's auto closed captioning that you can usually get through YouTube streaming. I'm not too sure about how that's working on Facebook, but I'm going to provide the transcript to JB afterwards and we'll make sure that that's available so that you can revisit with access. Okay, so now that um, that bit is over, let's talk about why I'm here to give you this talk today. So um, I actually started out as a curious musician um, and I was playing piano from the age of four and uh, started gigging when I was probably about, I started writing my own music very early on about 12 and then started gigging when I was about 16, 17 and then went on to try and, uh, well, I went to a, a, a rock school and did a songwriting diploma and, uh, yeah, I, I kind of was really, got really captured and captivated by audio recording. So I actually um, moved on to become an audio engineer. I studied a, a degree in audio engineering and that got me really into messing around with recording and synthesis. And soon after completing that degree, actually, I went into um, computer science, which is a rather strange diversion, <laughs> um, but it was uh, to move into a PhD in accessible digital musical instruments, which was something that was very close to my heart at the time um, due to, uh, I had a family member who unfortunately suffered a traumatic brain injury. And I, for my end of year project for my undergraduate audio engineering degree, I thought, wouldn't it be great if there were ways that technology could enable us to enact with music without you having to necessarily have some of the full cognitive function that you might require, like remembering things and the, the kind of impact that had happened to my family member were short term memory loss and not being able to interact or remember how to do a thing or what they'd just done. So I was trying to design something that would work for that. And, and that kind of got me thinking about why aren't we using technology in a more accessible way? Like why we have these devices, we have all of these new inventions, but we aren't actually putting them to task for accessibility yet. Um, so that was something that I really wanted to, to focus on. Um, and whilst I was doing my PhD, I actually started attending hackathons and kind of inadvertently became an ambassador for, for women in tech and other underrepresented folk in the technology industry. And that led me to become a developer advocate. So that's meant that I have spent the last few years traveling the world and talking about all the different bits of technology, um, but overall accessibility has been one of these underlying and core values of mine throughout that process. So what are we gonna look at today? Well, uh, we're gonna cover um, what does it mean to be inclusive or quote unquote inclusive? Like, are we talking about simplification? What are we talking about in terms of music devices? Um, 
then looking at the affordances of technologies that are used in music making and how we can check in with those to see what we can be doing to make them more accessible. And the barriers that we need to break. Then we're going to look at a couple of current, I say quote unquote, accessible technologies. Um, what I mean by that is in air quotes is technologies I have used in accessible music making workshops, not necessarily designed to be that way, uh, but have some features that lend themselves to being used for that, that, for that particular reason. And we'll talk about some of the, the benefits of them and some of the slightly failings of them, I guess, in ways and what are the barriers to using them right now. Um, I was going to demo these, but sound live streams, I think we all know the, the difficulties here. Um, so I think today I'll just, I'll, I will show you to them, like physically show you them. Um, but there's plenty of videos where you can see things happening with these devices as like plenty of demonstrations online. Um, so I can point you to a few of those afterwards in the chat. Um, right. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what my research has, has told me so far and what research around the world is telling us about this. And we're going to look at, I'm going to give you a couple of resources as well today to take away with you. So if you want to start thinking about accessibility in your music practice as an artist, or if you're in a product team that's developing something and you want to say, hey, where do I head to, to even start? Uh, accessibility is one of those things that can be really overwhelming because once you start looking into it, you can start realizing there's a lot of accessibility debt and there's a lot of challenges that you might have to face and that can then make it even harder to find the point where to begin. So I'll give you some resources today to help you with that. And then we'll have some time for questions. And because I'm really, really fun, uh, I do have a take home exercise, uh, but it is literally just for your fun. Uh, oh, that's really great to know. The, the auto captions on Facebook are really good. So that's fantastic. Um, yeah, so uh, let's get started then. So what does it actually mean to be inclusive? Uh, for technology designers specifically, I'd like to just take you to two quotes that I came across a couple of years ago and that have really kind of resonated with me in terms of what inclusive design means. So there is a quote from Emily Tate from Mind the Product. Um, and this was in uh, a, a copy of Interactions magazine in 2018 on an article called Putting Accessibility First. I'll read the quote aloud. Building accessible products is the right thing to do. As the technology becomes more ingrained into everyday life, the ability to use digital products is a necessity. Therefore, from an ethical perspective, ensuring a diverse set of customers can use your product is a moral imperative. And I have, in this sentence, highlighted some of the like key words to me in yellow. Like it's, it's the right thing to do. And the ability to use digital products, especially in today's climate where you know, we're, we're in a situation that we've never faced globally really before um, with the technology that we have. And there is still a, a huge amount of barriers to, for people to access that technology. Um, you know, we were talking at, at the beginning of the stream about the closed captioning and whether it's available or not available. And you'll be surprised about how many times that's actually going to be not considered in an event uh, or an online webinar that's been spun up quickly, as many, many events like this have. And that's something that that imperative that Emily's talking about here is the moral imperative is, is getting much, much stronger right now because there are a, a ton of people that will be isolated in the situation where they are alone and unable to access the things others can and that that creates this separation and it's it's not equality the other quote in this um in this article talked about that that sense of equivalence and equality and it's from jonathan lazar who actually won the special interest group in Commu computer human interaction social impact award that's a very big mouthful but um what Jonathan said was that the overall goal should be making sure that everyone has equivalent access. If it takes the average person who can see 10 seconds and the average person with a visual impairment five minutes, that's not equivalent usability. That's not equivalent access. 
And that one is something that really made me realize that, yes, there are a lot of people out there and a lot of products out there that build accessibility features or build in the ability to use a screen reader or something that is accessible, but they, they build it to meet a checkbox and they don't build it to meet equivalents. And that can be really detrimental to somebody's experience. So we're not trying to, you know, when we're talking about equivalence, I, I want to talk about the, the viewpoint that we're, we want to look at accessibility from. Because there are people out there who are like, oh, aren't you just going to make something a lot simpler if you're trying to make it accessible? And that's kind of a very grand uh, statement that doesn't actually think about what the problem is you're not trying to simplify in fact oversimplification can cause the opposite of equivalence because it makes somebody feel like they've been diminished um, so we're trying to make something equally accessible and usable by all and that means providing it in ways that is equally accessible and usable by all so in talking about that kind of equivalence there are so many guidelines that talk about accessibility and i'm just going to take a few moments to cover and, and bring your awareness to the web content accessibility guidelines um, i worked with uh, samsung internet as a developer advocate a few years ago and i was i was doing a lot with the web standards uh, groups and committees in terms of uh, talking about web content and accessibility and they have some really great guiding principles on what being accessible means and in doing this they use an acronym called well an acronym which spells out POUR P-O-U-R and I'm going to just talk about what this stands for because I think it's really helpful to conceptualize okay this is what good accessibility looks like so the first letter is P and that's for perceivable and uh, perceivable means that the information and user interface components must be presentable to people in ways in which they can perceive, which in, which boils down to it must not be invisible to all of the sen all of their senses. Now, what that means is if the, you're providing content or a product that can only be accessed visually, you're isolating those who have low or no vision, or and you're you're not really providing equal opportunity for a person to be able to use your product or access your content. The O stands for operable. And this means that the user interface and its components and navigation must be operable. And that sounds like, well, duh, like it, it must be something that I ever can do. But it, it means essentially that it cannot require an interaction that a user cannot perform. And if we think about the spectrum that is accessibility and people's different abilities, we're, we're finding different things that that might be. So the most common example of this online is there's a button or a scroll that isn't accessible via a keyboard input or alternative device. So it's kind of lost or you end up in a loop if you're using a keyboard uh, to navigate a website and that can really break the experience for people. So if you're asking a person who cannot use a mouse or a gesture to perform something and that's the only way that they can access it, then you're limiting their ability to interact with the thing that you're giving to them. And that means that most of the time they'll, they'll leave feeling like, well, I can't use that. And that can be really, really tricky. The U in this phrase stands for understandable. And uh, again, information and the operation of user interface must be understandable. And you might think, well, Sure, of course, that makes sense. But it means that the, that it shouldn't, the information that you're providing or the operation shouldn't be beyond the user's understanding. And one of the classic kind of accessibility fails for this particular, like this particular phrase is that the people assume a lot. So assumptions are like a really classic fail. So Sometimes we like it, it can be as simple as making an assumption on our based on our own cultural bias. So using a local terminology that doesn't translate well uh, and that could be completely lost in translation for people um, from from places that are like different places in the world to you. 
And uh, I actually think uh, there's a really great option that I'd like to point out here that there's a lot of work being put into plain language. Um, and it's worth looking up if you're interested in making sure that like internationalization and also um, that you're providing for accessibility, plain language is a really great way to make a start there. And it doesn't just help for that internationalization and translation that I'm mentioning, but it's also for cognitive load and processing. And again, we're not talking about oversimplifying or simplification here. We're talking about putting things into understandable words that gives everybody the same level of access. And that's that's um, a really great thing. And you know, that in music technology, especially, there's a lot of jargon. There's a lot of things that we are expecting people to go away and learn on their own. And sometimes just being able to provide like a the the TLDR, if you like, the too long did not read um, version of oh here's here's a glossary of terms in case you you're not familiar with these because we do we throw terms around so easily and we don't often think well everybody knows what one of those is and it's easy to make that make that assumption and the last thing is robust so the R in poor stands for robust and. Again, this is the, the content or whatever you're providing must be robust enough that it can be interpreted reliably by a wide variety of they call them user agents, including assistive technology. So when we're talking about user agents, it does mean in web terms, it means browsers. It means, you know, the, the different systems that might access a website. Uh, and that can include screen readers and other other devices that you might want to use to control websites and browsers. Um, in this circumstance, it kind of sums down to it shouldn't break easily. And talking about it in terms of an online and software capacity um, is kind of like, well, what do you mean it shouldn't break it? Well, if you cannot provide access through a screen reader, that's breaking the experience for somebody who might be using your software. So I should be able to use your technology with whatever with whatever additional technology I require to use uh, my computer or any other day-to-day -day interaction I have. And this is why, uh, like like JB said, you might think, okay, well, that's, that's all well and good, but truly how many people are actually out there using my product that are likely to have this accessibility requirement? And, well, the figures actually uh, show the statistics show that it, it could be almost 20% of the world's population that have a registered disability. Um, there is some wavering, it's sort of between 15 and 20% that different reporting. And this one is uh, from the link at the bottom there, uh, which I'll also transcribe out for you. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so 20%, sorry. And um, that's really not including those that haven't chosen to disclose uh, their disability because of social, well, like social and societal bias, which is one of the things that puts a lot of people off from even disclosing that they have an accessibility requirement, like through fear of not getting an opportunity or fear of being treated differently. And also doesn't include those that have conditions that are temporary, such as a broken arm or something like a recovering from an operation, or those people that have a condition that might fall outside of the scope for quote unquote disability registration, which is kind of like the official government or government guidelines or whatever it is in your location, like the kind of legal definition of disability. There are still people who live with a disabling condition that impacts their daily experiences that wouldn't be considered, um, that wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily be registered for this figure. So that could actually be a lot more. And I talk about that so much because it is considering it to be one in five of the potential audience for the thing that you're designing or the website that you're running or the the product or the digital instrument that you've created. And I'm pretty sure when you get to a company level, most like you wouldn't be, like 
convince most CEOs that, that giving up 20% of their revenue is a good thing. Um, but by isolating these groups of people with inaccessible technology, you could easily be doing that. You could easily be saying, you know, that's, that's fine, you don't use our product, and therefore they'll go and invest in a product that they can use. And the most common comment I get when talking about this, as I mentioned before, and especially to new groups with uh, about accessibility and inclusion topics is, why are you not doing this to help this particular group of people? So like, why aren't you providing information about childcare services for your event? And often people go, oh, well, we don't have any parents attending our event or using our product. And, and it's like, have you, often my, my rebuttal to that is, have you actually thought about why could it, because, could it be because you don't have the information out there? And it's the same with accessibility. It's like, if you don't have access, the reason you don't have anybody requesting it is potentially because it's inaccessible in the first place. So they're not even going to try and ask because why, like if you haven't considered it, the chances are, or at least said something in your documentation about we are considering this, the chances are they're not going to believe that it's going to be changed or the pathway is going to be changed because they speak up and ask for a specific feature. And that is a lot of the, the thought process around accessibility at the moment is that it's a feature to be added on later. And one of the things I like to do in my talks is talk about accessibility as a foundation to build from as opposed to a feature to be added later. Because it helps you with the accessibility debt, it helps you include more people, and it actually makes a lot of products become more accessible for everyone through being accessible for people with specific abilities. So let's take a look at ways that you can include people with different abilities in your product lifecycle and uh, in the development of new instruments. Or if you're an artist, perhaps uh, look at ways that you can be doing that to be more opening and inclusive to your audience as well. So the first thing of, uh, that we're going to talk about here is the, uh, the ways that inclusive design can consider people with different abilities throughout the whole entire design process. So you might want to start with something like walkthroughs uh, with different personas. Uh, this can be uh, finding personas online that uh, cover common uh, abilities or conditions and you want to create a, a person with that persona and kind of try and walk through your products like how would that how would that experience be for this persona? Um, you might also want to do walkthroughs using assistive technology. So one of the things I like to show people specifically about web accessibility is, you know, using a screen reader and keyboard access and how many times you get trapped in a loop inside certain websites. There are some really big name websites that you wouldn't believe, like you, you get through the first two links at the top and then all of a sudden you're at the bottom of the page and you have no idea how to get back. And it's because they haven't thought about the logical tab order and the way that their website is laid out. And they've just gone, well, it supports the screen reader. What, like, it, you know, you can access it using the screen reader, but that's not equivalent access because it doesn't, doesn't even read in the same order if you were to just scroll up and down the page. It really does, it really does surprise you how many times that happens on, on most websites as well. You can also do paid user testing. So making sure that you're including people with disabilities in paid user testing is really, really important. Even um, if that's just focus groups where you're offering something like a voucher and you're um, bringing people in just to, to get lived experience. Because again, the danger of trying to create personas or just walking through with assistive technology is you're not really getting the lived experience of those devices, especially if you're a new user with assistive technology, it's going to take you a while to build up to the level of somebody who's used assistive technology for however many years or almost throughout all their life. And you'll find that there are different speeds, there's different personalities, there's different preferences uh, that you'll you'll find with assistive technology users. So it's is really interesting to actually get first-hand experience and be able to build empathy with people and really understand where the problem is because you might end up like questioning a, a, a specific aspect that 
wouldn't wouldn't even cross the mind of somebody who's using assistive technology like it wouldn't be a focus point for them it would be something else and you're you're missing that so that would be really good and also i've put here um, there's the microsoft inclusive design toolkit that's used in tech world quite a lot and that has a lot of great resources to share with uh, teams who are building things uh, and also, it's a really great eye opener for the things I talked about before about temporary disability and also, you know, just the, the different conditions that you might encounter when considering accessibility requirements. And for any artists that are thinking about gigs that they're either going to put on online or fingers crossed at some point in the future in person, those, those accessibility requirements can make a huge difference to somebody being able to participate in your audience and, and really enjoy your music. Right, so we've covered all of the, the things that are kind of guidelines about accessibility and things you might want to do to build accessibility in, but let's actually look at digital technology specifically and the affordances of digital technologies in music making. So technology, since uh, kind of the dawn of the electric era, has uh, come a very, very long way. So since we saw electronic sound recording begin in the 1920s, we now have amazing things that are happening with sound and computers and things that have been developed over time. And there's such a wide choice of instruments to choose from. Uh, there are those that model acoustic, the acoustic counterparts, so things that are based on a specific type of interface. You might have seen, like, the piano is clearly one that has been modeled very, very far and wide in different types of synthesizers. But we've even had a digital theremin be made. We've had different uh, MIDI controllers for brass instruments. There are lots of things out there. Uh, and there are things that are completely novel as well and seek to change the way in which we engage and experience sound too. So sometimes you might have digital instruments that are generating their own sounds. And other times the, the synthesis option is completely up to you and your computer by using it, using the device as a MIDI controller. Uh, but the important thing is that with each wave of these different types of new instruments and novel instruments is that technology has opened up ways for us to interact with sound like that are so varied. And that's really, really interesting for accessibility. Uh, and just to, I'm, I'm displaying a picture of Wendy Carlos uh, when she was in her mid twenties using the Moog synthesizer here, just as kind of a, a historic nod, um, which, uh, a Moog synthesizer, I can only describe visually, like describe audibly as a, a tall wall of ports, pan pots and switches with many wires crossing over one another, uh, which is attached to a two layer piano keyboard interface. And in this image, Wendy is a slim white woman sitting at the keyboard with one hand on the keys and the other reaching up to make changes to one of the potentiometers on the wall of wires. Uh, of this really iconic synth. And you can see her face is tilted as she appears to listen towards the synthesizer's output. And I wanted to share this, not only because it's such an iconic and historical image, but because we've come so very far in terms of the changes from these large physical interfaces to today's applications where so many of these controls have been merged into the press of a single button or the tap of a screen. And we, we've like made it a lot simpler to be able to access this this grand like kind of conceptual synthesis um, but we haven't really even got into the smallest part of how that could open up the potential for greater accessibility so let's look at the different interfaces that can help with accessibility and what affordances they have for accessibility so touchable interfaces they are good because you can change the sensitivity of them. Anything that has some kind of controller, fader, like uh, some kind of malleable sensibility you can actually start to, to change or at, at least tap into, could I make the sensibility, like the sensitivity tailorable? And if you can, opening up that possibility will open up those with different abilities of touch. So being able to 
use the slightest degree of touch or the slightest degree of movement can really help uh, somebody with a mobility impairment. Um, they're also very malleable. So for somebody who relies on touch more than visual interfaces, this can be really great to, to know and understand. However, things have changed over time and some, some of the things that we've, we've lost, like we went through a fixation of having these really nice sweepable potentiometer pots, but there's no haptic feedback on them. So you're just sweeping around in a circle and there's no min or max point that's like they used to be on physical potentiometers. So when we lose those kind of feedback sensations, that can make it equally inaccessible. We have to consider those. We also, um, and this is, as I was saying, it, it creates this ability to have kind of a visual independence. If I can feel what I'm doing, if I can sense where I am on, a, on keys or on a particular controller with buttons, if I can count them, then I can have a visual independence. And whether that's visual independence because it's out of my line of sight or because I have low or no vision, that really helps in making it more usable and more accessible in different ways. And there's also this familiarity of devices. Now, anybody who may have worked in audio or has grown up around that kind of analog hardware, when we move into the digital and we keep some of these physical forms and allow them to be manipulated in different ways, we create this familiar, like the familiarity. So, you know, I talk about mimetic gestures in my work a lot because when we do this, uh, which is I'm miming, playing my um, fingers in the air uh, as a piano, and similarly, if I mime a bow motion, people will generally automatically think, automatically think of a violin. Um, I'm going to talk about iPads in a moment, Power. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about that. Um, but... Yeah, th this this idea that we have familiarity can help in exploring a new device and accessing it and making it more usable for somebody who has that familiarity. The next um, kind of interface that I've worked quite heavily with is completely gesture controlled interfaces. And these uh, can, uh, well, generally are instruments that just respond to body movement. They can be wearables, they can be non-wearable and camera-based, uh, things like a leap motion device or a webcam or using uh, back in the day an Xbox Connect or something to trigger music from watching somebody's movement. Uh, you also might find there's uh, the different armbands that you can buy, I think what's called my armbands, um, to, that you can then program. And these allow people to do things with in-air gestures. And that can be really, really helpful because when playing or pressing a physical interface or anything that requires a specific amount of strength is difficult, that can, like freeing that up and it just being an in-air gesture can be really, really helpful. Um, as I said, this can be wearables. Um, and it one of the reasons that I find them quite interesting for accessibility requirements is because we can then play very heavily with thresholds we can really tailor something and set something based on a user's ability and tailor that to, to what somebody is going to use it for. And so I can make, you know, I can make a sweep of a, of a sine wave really like from a frequency of low here to here. And I can actually then really minimize that range and still have the same responsiveness. And that's, really great in providing access that is specific to a user. Um, they're also, oh, there we go, said it already, very tailorable. So that's what, one of the things that I've found. I will give a slight nod though to gesture interfaces. One of the major problems with them is the machine learning algorithms behind them. Unfortunately, a lot of camera-based interfaces uh, and the leap motion isn't excluded here, the connect definitely isn't excluded here have been modeled and trained on images of able bodies. And that excludes a huge group of people. So for example, there's many instances of the Kinect not being able to recognize wheelchair users or sitting users, pe people who are sitting and not able to stand for long periods of time. 
Uh, there is uh, the leap motion. I specifically um, experienced it not recognizing a hand motion uh, from one of my users because they had uh, closed hand syndrome. So this meant that their hand was displayed more with a finger down at all times and they weren't able to outstretch their hand. And the leap was looking for these gaps between their fingers and that that just didn't register. And so that can be really isolating and actually provide quite a negative effect for, for users and gestural interfaces. So choosing the right one for the person that you're working with is really important as well. In terms of uh, apps and, and using an iPad screen or using phone apps, um, there are so many out there now. Um, there's just been... Uh, yeah, there's just been a lot of a lot of like surges of different things happening. And I find that apps are good for some reasons and bad for others. So again, we go into this familiarity concept of the device. A lot of people who are using assistive technology are using it through their phones now or through an iPad or through another tablet device. And they're used to using the features of that particular operating system. Uh, and how they can get accessibility through that operating system. Where apps can fail here is by not providing access to, to let the device's own inbuilt accessibility read and understand, like the screen readers read and understand the, the, the app that they're using. It also can do things like if it doesn't allow external sound into, into the app because it needs to also play the, the screen reader, uh, specific choices of gestures and not recognizing that certain ones are, are reserved for when you're using voiceover or an accessibility feature. So when you hover tap over things with it voiceover on, it tells you, so just a single tap will tell you what you're about to click. You double tap to interact with that and that doesn't always transpire into different music apps that decide to, to use um, or to allow access to the screen reader. It doesn't necessarily mean that they've built, built in what actually using the ex the accessibility feature or screen reader is like. Um, there tend to be a lot of generative audio scopes, uh, like scapes in this. So there are some really, really great uh, iPad apps that I've come across and other apps that I've come across in my research. Um, a nod to things like Bloom and Thumb Jam. Uh, Bloom was a project with Brian Eno and it's it's a generative soundscape and actually i've found works very very well for people who are on the autistic spectrum or have, have like have cognitive overload and it can just be a really calming way and you can fix like you can use that within a lot of pieces without it being a jarring experience um but these do kind of then limit controllability and they Again, there's a lot of things with an iPad screen that if you can't see it, um, they, they're heavily visual reliant. Um, there is a lot of gamification that happens in these as well, which can be good and bad. It can be like simplification or uh, it can make it feel like it's being made to be more childlike. And that's not something you necessarily want if you have somebody who's just trying to join in with music in a very serious way giving them something that has been gamified can be a little bit jarring for that experience. Um, but as, and as I mentioned before, the integration with assistive technologies is a, is a big barrier here. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a, a bit of a look at what the affordances are of different types of technologies. The, the, the thing that I always advise is to try many things. Um, we always, when I'm working with people, we always have sessions of just trying out everything that I, that I have discovered and figuring out whether anything works the best. And if it doesn't, trying something new or discovering new ways or inventing something um, that would make it accessible. So you're not limited completely. And one of the things I like to do when people are evaluating these, um, when people are evaluating new piece of technology, uh, is to, to go through these questions about what does the technology tell somebody? So how does it tell you how you interact with it? How soon can you interact with it? What kind of sound does it generate? Does, does the 
It's just the visual or physical appearance when you're feeling it, when you're looking at it. Does it tell you these things? Does it give you an idea? Um, again, with seeing versus feeling. So what what is the, with many of these devices, what's the differences there? And what can be changed about it? So is there ways for me to tailor this? And what doesn't it do? And can I tell all of those things from my first interaction with it? I like to consider these questions when I'm working with new technology, but I'll often ask somebody without my knowledge to try and answer them because I might make slightly educated guesses that will land me in kind of a scope about where it is working um, or what it might actually do. But that doesn't mean that that is uh, an inherent observation about the technology that everybody would make. And it's kind of, I'm using my assumptions then. And, and this kind of question of what doesn't it do leads us to the next big challenge, which is barriers. And we have so many of them when it comes to uh, technology and making music with digital musical instruments. So I'm gonna just go through some of the, the common barriers I've seen in my work to date, and then talk a little bit about my research. Now, aesthetic is kind of been a really important thing in music tech over the years, and the way something looks is very part of its selling power. And often many things are kind of overlooked to achieve the aesthetic that it fits. Um, so non-visual interaction is one of those things that's quite commonly looked at, well, not, not looked at very well, because uh, we tend to have a lot of devices that are based on lights and flashy and you know uh, leds and looking a for a specific type of user they're focusing on you know what does it look like in a club what does it look like for this is it attractive to this type of artist and they're considering that above actually how like how much of it is visual and you know how how much of it is solely visual as well there are some devices out there that you could only tell what it's doing from visual interaction. And that's really hard to then give to somebody who has low or no vision. Um, then things like being able to set up multiple profiles on a device. So being able to say, oh, I want to have this particular arrangement. We've got this a lot in a lot of uh, controllers these days. Um, you know, being able to tailor them yourself, but then how much work is involved to get them to that stage of tailoring? How much understanding do you do you have to spend days in the manual <laughs> and watching YouTube videos just to get to that level? And how like how easy is it then to change between modes and and understand that when something's worked successfully or not? And I think again, we we use a lot of visual cues for this kind of stuff, and that can be kind of problematic. We also uh, have to consider with technology specifically being able to to work seamlessly across many devices. There has been many, many times where I have pulled up a thing to like an app to share to somebody and gone, this is a really great app. You should use it at home. You have a tablet, right? And they've gone, yeah, it's Android. I'm like, oh, this is iOS only. And it's an automatic barrier. Like, oh, I'm going to have to find something in a different store that does the same thing, but I'm, I'm not gonna be able to know if it does it as well. And that again is a really, really difficult thing. Like is, is the experience of your product the same across all the devices, all of the networks they might need and all of the different operating systems? And are you testing for that? Um, another big one is just being able to change the orientation and, and like positioning in in a device and in a space like can you actually mount it on a stand can you like what are you, what you're using can you change the way that it way around that it is without it affecting the playability of it uh and then things like unconventional scoring and creating common understanding is often used in some of the workshops that i i have been part of and that can be limited by technology because if you're uh trying to assimilate a lot of different types of technology that might be using different types of keys and other things as well. Um, some might have very set specific keys that don't give you necessary notation, but tell you that they're, you know, working over a specific 
subset, like that can be really difficult to align everything to work together. And one of the things that we always look for when we're working in, in app worlds is can I, can I key lock this? Can I set uh, a limit to where things are going so that we're all in the same range? And then that will help us understand like how this will musically fit in with a piece. Um, and also that there are many changing of changing roles throughout pieces and complexity in anything like the setup or context switching can be really detrimental. And that is another thing that we need to look out for. But uh, one of the things I'm going to pull up as a biggest barrier, and I think any performing musician with tech will understand this, is connectivity. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, I, this is one of the biggest barriers I come up with through many of the novel instruments I work with and many of the others is just making sure that you are going to be able to perform with it within the space that you have. And that could be as simple as do we have long enough cables to, is it going to disconnect at any time, point in time? And I've known that for many novel instruments. Um, I've actually worked with uh, one of the Mimu Glovers and the Mimu team in the past. And some of the biggest challenges in providing access through novel instruments like that is making sure whether that whatever it is, is keeping up with an ever-changing landscape of new technology and ways of connecting and more powerful devices that it has to compete with. And that can be really, really tricky. So, um, yeah, uh, we, we, for example, at the proms had a, a networking issue and it was just like of all the things to to not work it's just a networking issue and but it it really did strip down the performance that we were able to to provide and that can be really really like frustrating for many many people involved not just the the artist that you're working with i'm just going to switch ahead now to look at some digital musical instruments um i was going to demo them i'm not going to because of the internet and live streaming and all of the gremlins that were bound to get me. So I'm uh, just gonna walk through some and show you what I've been using in some of my workshops and then I'll talk about my workshops and we can head into some questions. So let's start with a thing called the Skoog. I don't know if anybody in the stream has heard of the Skoog before. Um, it's got a, a fun name to say, Skoog, and it's by Skoog Music. Um, it was actually designed with accessibility in mind. Uh, it's a MIDI controller made out of conductive foam covered in a soft rubber type covering uh the the base though is a plastic card casing um and it comes with its own app and you can connect it to many different devices over bluetooth you can also just use it as a midi controller inside your own uh, digital audio workstation so like with ableton for instance you can connect it as as a midi device um and Initially, the design looked very different from the image here. Um, I'm just going to give a quick audio description. It's a black cube shaped device with round dome parts in the center of each of the faces, except for the base. And around each circle shaped dome is a highlight is highlighted by a, a ring of color around it. Um, in this picture, the ring that we the dome that we can see on the front face is got a yellow ring around it. Um, the original design, if you look up the Skoog version one, actually was completely different. And it was a white cube and each of the domes were a solid block of color and they were very like red, blue, yellow, green. And it actually received quite a lot of negative feedback because it looked too toy lap, like too much like a toy. And this is where I'm talking about simplification isn't necessarily making usability and accessibility features. It's, it's not they're not synonymous. We can't say, oh, to make something accessible is to simplify it. It's not. And that is where it can you can get some pushback because you're essentially like providing something to a community with a, a grand oversimplification. And it makes other assumptions about the person and can actually be kind of demeaning to them. And it doesn't doesn't just observe their physical requirements. Um, this device is actually very good for different uses, and I'll comment on them from my own personal experiences, but remember this is my personal experience, and I have a very much you do you approach to technology for music making. So, uh, you know, if you are looking for something for a specific accessibility requirement or specific person, I would 
urge you to try out with them what works best. Um, the Skoog, uh, I have the actual thing here. Um, one of the things I found frustrating about it is on different surfaces, it has like rubber patches on the bottom. And on different surfaces, the pressure required, you would just push it straight over um, to actually press in the, the central parts. Um, the central parts are what trigger the sound, but you can trigger from like squeezing a corner. It, you can tailor the sensitivity somewhat. Um, I uh, do like the, because it's made out of conductive foam, things like uh, I have a, a, a chunk out of mine there because uh, one of my students bit through it. Um, one of the questions I ask a lot of technology designers is what does it happen if it goes in your mouth? And they think that I'm joking. Um, but yeah, the, the, also that I found that it wasn't very understandable early on and it depends what sound you pair it with as to how much somebody makes a link of and pressing the thing and it's making a sound um if you pair it with something that's kind of a like sound design is a big element of uh, these things as well so if you pair it with something that's like got a slow attack and you're not hearing it instantly the kind of feeling you would expect is more like a mallet with this like you're pressing you would expect kind of it to respond a bit more like a drum hit or a note or something that's got a fast attack. And when you don't have that connectivity, people tend to like not realize what they're doing with it or whether they're having any impact at all. Um, I also found that students just didn't know what to do with it. Some just like smacked it on the floor like this, expecting it to do something. Um, I guess uh, maybe there's some way to look into, could uh, an accelerometer or a gyroscope be put in there so that that actually did help um, or make a noise um, other than the noise that it makes from the physical surface it's clashing against. Um, the other thing that I've used quite a lot, and I, I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with these, the, the Roly blocks. Um, these are really good for um, connectivity, so with other syncing with other Roly devices and, and clicking into things and um, creating good light patterns and for for people that are trying to use uh, like that are very visually focused this can be really useful however they are very visual so they rely on lights and being able to tell the different colors apart very easily and the pressure is quite firm for these so you need to be able to have at least a dexterity index where you can push into this to to make a difference and to make the noises and that is one of the things that people have come up several times with me. Like you can, I think you can change the sensitivity, but again, it's kind of locked in. Uh, excuse my co-host, he might bark a few times right now. Um, yeah, I agree too, it's not good enough. Um, but the the changing element of that, like e anybody I provide this to to handle is very surprised at how hard you have to press to be able to create sound with those. and. Yeah, I think they they offer a lot of tailorability. Sorry about him. Um, they offer a lot of tailorability in terms of like again, you can use them as a MIDI controller in whatever interface. Um, the Skoog isn't. Uh, it's 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 both. You can hold on a note and you can just use it as a trigger. It, it depends on what your what the instrument setup that you have as well. If you're using their own app, there we go. He's out of the room now. If you're using your own app, uh, their own app, you can choose um, specific like specific instrument settings and how it responds will be different based on the instrument that you've chosen. If you're using it within a digital audio workstation, it will be however you have kind of what, what you've chosen and whether if it's like if it's a if it's like a, a fast attack drum sound what you might find is if somebody's slow pressing it will trigger several times so it's it's again balancing out the sound as I said sound design is kind of really important in choosing these things to make them accessible as well um, the other thing that I'd like to give a shout out to, because I actually really love this in my workshops, is the bot pad. Um, the bot pad is got a similar feel to uh, 
the the rolly blocks um, because it's made from a similar type of silicon design. And you can actually assign, um, so the block pad visually is a round uh, drum pad that has four core tiles um, like divided up with a, with a white central background with a black line dividing up the core tiles. And you can actually set up the, the tailorability of this super well. Like one of the things that has really, really surprised me um, about this has been really like how much I could tailor this and how really nicely presented the interface for doing that was. Like it didn't require me going away and reading a manual. I literally looked at it and went, that makes sense. And it was five minutes of plugging it in and getting to, to playing it. It also has some really great sensitivity settings. And, but it does have some reliance on the visual because of these quartiles being divided. You do need to have some, um, some things, uh, like some either ability to judge the space, but you do have, you do have a ring around it. So you can feel the edge of the target zone. Um, so you can run your finger along there, but you can't, the, the printing of this line isn't that obvious unless you, you're very sensitive, like you have very sensitive touch. I can feel it, but I don't know if I would recognize that that's what it was, um, without some extra like silicon layer there to, to divide it. Um, yeah, so I'm going to quickly talk to you now about the research I've been doing and then we'll have some time for some questions. So how my research has looked in a, in a real world view, um, we, we like I, I'll walk you through a quick field study. Um, I've done a couple of these now, um, but we work with a group of students, which is a small class size, usually up to 20 students. Uh, we work for five days to create a piece of music. We record found sounds from around the environment and we incorporate the use of both traditional and digital instruments in projects that we create. So we tend to record parts that we can use as backing tracks for the performers to then create motifs over and then they play their individual solo parts in, a, in the live setting. And it usually all culminates in a, in a one time live performance at the end of the project and in some cases uh, with a project that we did in 2016 we actually ended up doing multiple performances and taking that group of students to the BBC proms and they got to perform at the Royal Albert Hall as well in front of like six and a half thousand people which was an amazing thing um, that we that we were able to provide the accessibility to do um, and the kind of research that I was doing was doing a lot of observational stuff. I was uh, taking part as a facilitator, but my job really was there to be to observe and see what the what the challenges were. And what I found that we had to consider when talking about each of these instruments and what we need technology to be able to do is that it needs to work through these three interaction modes. So we need to think about how does it function when I'm creating something? What's the discoverability of the instrument like? We we know with uh, like acoustic instruments, there is a lot of like tactile uh, feedback and haptic feedback that we get from the vibrations or from the feel of the instrument itself or the interface we're using. There's a lot of uh, cultural like evaluation that we have. We've seen pianos over time and time and time. So we've grown up to know what they sound like and feel like and could play like you put a piano in a in a train station most people will walk straight up to it but you put something like the scoop down in front of somebody and they wouldn't really want to touch it or like they'd be apprehensive because they don't understand what that interface will do um then there's also the thing of practicing for digital technologies this can get a little bit uh worrisome because for example using the gesture controllers one of the things that I had to do was keep giving them rest throughout the day because they couldn't keep up like computationally with being on for like an eight hour day all of the time. And all of that thing of refreshing, making sure the connections were working was, was a lot of like things that you had to do with digital instruments. And just for example, every single one of these has a, a charge port, uh, whether it's the Roly device, the, the, even the bot pad or the scoop, they all require a battery life. The same with an iPad, and 
that is a long process. You have to make sure, like, if you forget to plug one in between one day of practice to the next, you're not going to have a device to hand. And a lot of the time we would label up devices or individual students just to keep the settings because the user profile recall wasn't good on all of the apps. So we had to just, like, that was then limiting them, like, no, that's so-and-so's iPad. Like, we can't, can't change it to be somebody else's and we can't easily switch another one in when it's run out of battery because it has specific settings that we've set up to be tailored to that user. Um, and then there's the challenge of performing. And that largely sits with uh, the issues we've talked about, about connectivity, but also uh, audience understanding of what, what it looks like to perform and, and being able to make sure that it's going to hold out through a performance. Uh, I, in one of the PROMS performances, was actually crouched behind uh, one of our students' wheelchairs furiously refreshing the settings of the leap motion because he decided to just dip out um, five minutes before the performance. So I was there on stage hiding, <laughs> doing my best as a facilitator to make sure that the tech worked for my student and artist who was going to be using that. Um, and those are all really big challenges for these different places. Um, I also noted that there's two different types of interaction cycles. There's the one between the, the performer, the ensemble, and the audience, which is what we generally think about when we're thinking about performing with technology. We want people to understand what we're doing. We want them to not think that we're checking our emails if we're using a laptop in performance. And we also want our, our co-performers to understand where we are in the piece and, and like have that same kind of rhythm that you would have on acoustic instruments together. And, and that same kind of connectivity that an ensemble performance does have. But you also then have this, this kind of facilitator role who is in tune with the, with the ensemble. The ensemble might be aware of them, but they're working generally one-on-one -on -one with the performer who needs support in whatever way. And that could be physical. It could just be for the technology. Um, but as a facilitator, your job is to be completely a, like invisible to the audience and you try your best to just keep yourself separated because the focus is on the person who's creating the artistry and the performance and your job is to to enable that in different ways depending on the requirements um and so that kind of led me to to create this idea of different stakeholders for digital musical instruments you have the performer you have the facilitator you have the ensemble around the performer and you also have the audience and a lot of frameworks in the past have just considered kind of this performer ensemble on sword an audience perspective and kind of missed out this gap that you might have somebody who's an intermediary who uses the technology but isn't the actual person performing with the technology and needs to have a solid understanding of it as well and that really brings me to kind of the summary of this that there is no one size fits all solution um, as i mentioned at the very beginning because Technology can be very tailored now, and we should look towards tailorability as the as the forward option. You know, that is key for people with different requirements and different abilities. And providing options allows for that tailorability. And if it's if you're able to do that in your practice or open up a different way to interact with your music, perhaps you're able to make sure that you are performing with closed captions in future, or that you're performing. Um, and things can be accessed in a different way or you're building an instrument and you're thinking about, well, how does it actually feel? I haven't thought about the feel of it as well as the visual cues. These are all things that we can be doing to provide like a tailorable options. Um, so next for me in the research is that I am actually building a framework for this, which is called facilitating access to musical experiences. And that will be a, a quite hefty academic piece of work for me. I'm in the middle of writing my PhD thesis right now. Um, and I've been working towards trying to build out an accessible instrument finder and community around that, which is something that I'd like to see launched in the next few years online um, to really connect these communities together that are working on this. Um, also, exploring the tailoring of digital musical instruments and softwares is something that I've been working towards and I've been talking to different companies about. I've spoken on a couple of panels at the Audio Developer Conference and at NAM and other things where we've, we've kind of highlighted what companies are doing right now about this. 
And there is some really good work out there. So I'd implore you to go look at what uh, certain tech companies are doing. Um, I've also thought that there needs to be some kind of taxonomy of musical gestures, but that kind of feels like another PhD in, in and of itself and probably don't have the time right now to, to, to be looking into that. But it's really interesting now that we have all these new technologies, what do we consider a musical gesture to be? Like we, we have, as I said, the miming that we've done before, um, playing the piano or uh, a trumpet or playing like a violin. We very much have these gestures as, associated with a particular instrument but what happens in the digital world and do we always see up is more do we always see like left to right do, do we assume what's going to happen from somebody's bodily movement i think that's a really interesting space to be looking at and as i mentioned i've been doing some work with the industry partners and research collaboration so i'm hoping that things will um be starting to make it to the forefront of uh, the, the kind of industry focus right now uh, and hopefully some of you might join me in uh, in doing this and I'll send you, I'm gonna, now just going to lay out some resources and then I'll answer any questions that you might have for me. Um, but yeah, if you would like to, to join in with something, um, here are some links for you. Um, I'll make sure that these are transcribed as well. Um, and they'll be, I'll be sharing the presentation, but um, you can join in with the work that I'm doing on the accessible instrument community um, through there's a there's a Google form that I have online, uh, and I'll be sending out updates once I start like getting into the the, the nitty gritty of building out this uh, accessible instrument community. Um, then you can also have a look at uh, specifically work with accessibility in music in general. There's a really great uh, charity organisation in the UK called Drake Music. I would highly recommend that you take a look at their website and the, the events that they're doing. They're doing some really great stuff during this lockdown as well, supporting uh, disabled artists and, and the music movement around the world. Uh, there'll be different versions of organizations like this in, in your different regions. So I would say, go, go find them. Um, and uh, then there are... Uh, things like the uk home office that have uh given some really great posters that you give you do's and don'ts for different accessibility requirements uh i like they're they're available in many different languages they're on a github repo and they're really really great just to have if you want to kind of have a visual reminder of what do and don't i do for for these kind of practices and these kind of accessibility requirements and if you want to learn about becoming uh, an accessibility professional, I'm actually certified as a web, accessi web accessibility specialist and uh, also a, a certified professional in accessibility core competencies. They're both very long titles, um, but the International Association of Accessibility Professionals uh, is, a again, a not-for-profit organization that helps people understand this subject more and get into being a practicing accessibility professional and helping change things around the world to, to be more accessible. And if you did want to look specifically for web content, but also for many other technologies, there's actually uh, an accessible specification technology for all, for all kinds of technologies being put out by the W3C organization now. Um, but the web content accessibility guidelines are a really great space to start as well. Um, so yeah, there's there's lots to think about, um, but I'm just uh, seeing if I missed any questions in the chat earlier. Uh, do you agree that open source and open standards improve accessibility? Yes, I definitely do. I'm a big advocate of open source uh, and did lots of work with GitHub over the years. Um, and yeah, I think one of the things that we can do on this is share knowledge. Uh, I find it quite frustrating inside of uh, inside of academia that a lot of the stuff that I'm finding and writing about and reading about gets kind of caught up in that bubble and is inaccessible to many people because of it being within academia. And I'd like to see a lot more connectivity and collaboration around the subject, for sure. I have a question for you, Amy. Um, so 
yeah so you, you can you can relax a little bit thank you so much for the for this talk it's, it's su super super interesting and and i think a lot of the design practices uh, that apply to music also apply to to a range of other uh, disciplines so exactly. and, and it was very um very visible in the talk uh, so to speak uh, because you, you you presented first uh, the general gu guidelines and I was wondering if you had, uh, I mean, you presented a few a few instruments that present some affordances that are relevant and, and that highlight what it means to be accessible and, and what it could mean to not be. Mm -hmm. uh, but more specifically, I suppose, in the software world, uh, in music, who are the the good guys and, and who are the bad guys, if you don't <laughs> mind the framing <laughs> of the question? Uh, well, I, again, uh, personal opinion don't work for anybody and not going to... Uh, not actually defaming anybody here, um, you'll find that uh, there are definitely people working towards accessibility that I know of from the inside track, um, but there are people who've achieved it as well. So native instruments, for example, have done a really great integration for all of their hardware and software um, at the moment to, to be able to use uh, screen readers with that. So with their latest, um, I didn't forget the name of it, uh, but one of their keyboard interfaces, you can actually uh, have it isolated so that you can hear the, the screen reader yourself in the headphones without having to have it be put out anywhere else. And, and that kind of solves this issue that I was talking about with the potentiometers that just sweep all the way around because they don't provide any haptic feedback. So actually having them read out what's happening and what you're selecting is really important because otherwise you would have not a clue um, what was happening. And I've, I've worked with, well, at, at the Audio Developer Conference, I was on a panel with a couple of people that use those instruments in their practice and have found that to be just like a, a game changer for accessibility. Uh, Avid and Pro Tools as well work very hard to make sure that their screen reader accessible. The issue with a lot of uh, digital audio workstations and software though is that you can make the platform itself accessible, but you can't make the integrations and the other things that people might build, sort of the VST plugins, or uh, for example, iLock uh, used to be really accessible and then it had an, and it made it completely inaccessible to screen readers. So that being changed meant that a, a, a producer I know was literally locked out of his own Pro Tools and had to had to ask his wife to read out the screen for him, which is not a solution when it worked before and that was an update, like that was a feature. Uh, and it's amazing that it could, you can actually buy, again, it's just like a, it's an oversight issue. It's a, we didn't think about it. And so we've gone ahead and updated something and completely cut out a whole entire section of people who were using our product before by a simple update. And we all know that that can happen in the tech world quite a lot, especially um, with all the updates that you have on your technology these days um, and subscriptions and stuff that lock you out of things. But generally, yeah, like uh, you can't, there's only so much I think that each company can do. And I know that there are ones that currently aren't accessible, but I've, I have rumblings that they are working on being very accessible. So let's hope that it's setting a precedent uh, across the industry. So, you know, where, Pro Tools and Native Instruments have started is where the rest of them are going to carry on from. And they're going to start having specifically things like screen reader access, but also like being able to use, as I said, any kind of user agent or assistive technology to be able to control what they're doing would be really good. Okay. So, so if people wanted to have a benchmark of how the screen reader readers operate, then uh, Pro Tools and Native Instrument would be a good place to start. And Native yeah. Instrument specifically, it's it's the plugins, the plugin ranges. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, it's I would say Native have, have done a lot of work. I would imagine there's quite a few presentations about that online. Um, I don't have any links to videos right now, but I could probably, if I find something that talks about this in a big thing, or I can ask the people who worked on it if they have anything that they, they've written about it, because it was a really big step for them. And I know that it took a lot of work and it's really paid off. Um, right. Like, And that's one of the things they've, they've actually commented on how good it was for the business as well. Right. Like not just the fact that it was great for these particular um, people that they had test the thing, 
but also for the business once once they opened it up people were just like wow that's amazing and yeah you, you'd be surprised how how much of a difference it makes that's great thank you and uh so uh, i i do i did want it to be controversial about this and and i guess you know <laughs> really just feels a bin so on, on the bad guys <laughs> but i think it's safe to assume that most companies in music uh, uh, i mean aspire to, to to get there but um yeah, I, I would a lot of them have not implemented hmm. screen readers. I yeah, and I would say that it's it's never any company that I've come across that isn't doing that as a practice right now, isn't because they're like it's not intentional in terms of the they're not intentionally avoiding doing it. It's that there there isn't there hasn't been the the foundational support for it. So it's becoming that there's an awareness rising throughout the industry, and I'm really glad to see that. I'd love to put, like push fast forward on it. Um, I'd really love to like really push people and say, "Come on, you should do this now." Um, but you know, the fact that there's even people coming to me and asking, like, "How would we start this?" or "Where do I go from here?" is really really great because I've been doing this research for five years now, and when I started. Uh, like fi even finding academic papers it was like me and three people in the world looking at like specifically the computer side of of this and the technology side of this and not from a humanities perspective so it's it's been uh it's been kind of a lonely ride <laughs> uh, and then and then i got to meet a lot of great people in those companies and have have had the chance to do some really great things and i'm just hoping that that continues to blossom and this community grows yeah, well, I can sort of you observe. I mean, music is such a, um, a wonderful activity, and, and when you consider that you have already a disability, then and that that prevents you from from doing a lot of things. Um, yeah. You can imagine how satisfying it would be to have access to to, uh, to the range of things that um, that are available for for exactly. And there's, people. Yeah. there's even a whole rehabilitation side to to music. Uh, in general, through music therapy and other things that I've, I've had chance to be involved with too, but uh, exact, and that's exactly where I came from. It like came at this problem from because I was looking at rehabilitation and the con like what can uh, the brain respond to, and music is actually one of the the longest surviving things. You know, your echoic memory is is lasts longer than your iconic memory, so you're your hit your memory of sound lasts longer than your memory of seeing something and that's really important when you look at like the neuro the neuroscience behind it as well but that gets really like wildly out there so let's not go down that route <laughs> great well um i think you have prepared some homework and okay. an invitation to everybody to participate <laughs> to this uh so uh, do, do you want to take that in should, should i we share you so you put your screen up or yeah go ahead um All right. so yeah if you would like to uh have a go at this i'd like you to consider if you were to design an accessible instrument what would it be you could think about your own instrument or your own practice to start with this or you could just go completely you know off of something uh like just off of a base of nothing and just uh one of the things that i'd like you to do is to kind of Think about a type of interaction. Is it touch? Is it gesture? Is it an application? Is it something else um, that I haven't listed here? Um, and consider what barrier does it does it tackle? And then like kind of sketch out what that might be. Um, so a rough drawing, it doesn't have to be anything special, but like what does it look like? How do I interact with it? Like I used to really enjoy like when I was a kid, dream like drawing my dream house and there was no limitations and I could like draw a slide instead of stairs and stuff like that. And I really want you to think just outside of like what's possible, what would be great for this particular barrier and what could you do? And then write down like the steps for interaction with it. And you can just do that as bullet points. Like how do I interact with the thing? Uh, how does it start? One of the designs I have for an accessible instrument is um, uh, if anybody's used a Raspberry Pi before, I was gonna encase one in like, you can get these clear baubles from, for your Christmas tree. I was going to encase one in that and then cover it in silicone and have like a light thing on the inside, but you could just move it through space and it would change the sound because it has a gyroscope and an accelerometer and all this data that you can collect and use to manipulate something. 
And I was probably going to build it with a Max MSP patch that did all these weird and wonderful things. But um, it's one of those side projects that I started and then is in a box right now, uh, <laughs> maybe for after the PhD. <laughs> uh, but things like that really get me thinking, like, how much fun uh, would it be to have a device that allowed us to use this as a way of interacting? And because it's Global Accessibility Awareness Day, um, if you do take up this this thing that's completely optional and just for fun, but if you want to, you could tell us about it on Twitter. You could tweet me and the Music Hackspace, and um, you, you use this hashtag Inclusive DMIs and the Global Accessibility Awareness Day 2020 because I really would like to to start this conversation more about accessible instruments and uh, yeah, it would be really really fun to see what other people's brains create because. Again, I'm just very aware that I have this very niche, niche knowledge. And the more I know about this, the less I know about everything else. You know, um, it's it's the more I think I know, the less I really am, like, the more I'm aware that I know absolutely nothing. And <laughs> there's so much more to learn. And I'd love to see some collaborative attempts with this as well. It would be really, really great. Um, if you do want to get hold of me, uh, I'm Amy Dickens at the Mixed Reality Laboratory, which is where I do uh, my research with. Uh, my, my research email is amy.dickens at nottingham.ac.uk, which is my university. If you want to get hold of me there, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, but mainly you can also get hold of me through uh, Twitter and uh, I have projects on GitHub and also uh, through my, my own website, which is adickens.co.uk. So, yeah, if you want to talk to me on any of those platforms, um, I'll switch back to, to the design thing. Um, please do tell us about it if you decide to go ahead with something. It would be fun. Um, and, yeah, uh, I really enjoyed talking to you all tonight. It was uh, Thank it's been you. a while since I've done this kind of presentation or about this specific subject. I've done so many technology presentations and never about never get to really go into accessibility and music stuff. So thank you for having me on. Well, thank you so much for... for you're taking the time to present this and um now this uh recording this recorded live stream will will you know uh ha have a, a long life i hope and, and people can can refer to it and, and get inspiration i'm sure and I, I hope that many of you would see an interest in participating to this project i think that continuing the discussion past the global accessibility awareness day is important and that mm -hmm. in our daily lives we can we can all contribute to to making things uh, more accessible um well thank you everyone who followed uh thank you for uh thank you daniel ginger uh, leon everybody who um put some very nice comment nella uh, laura martin so a lot of uh, very uh, uh, interesting uh, topics today um so on monday we have um nothing because it's a holiday in the uk and i'm taking the day off uh, and our next talk is on Thursday with David Zickerelli, the CEO of Max MS of Cycling 74, who makes uh, software Max MSP, and is going to talk about multi-channel audio in Max, which uh, is, is a rare occasion. So I hope to see many of you uh, to come and see David. And then we have two workshops followed, following that on Saturday 30th, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Uh, so check them out. Um, Amy, thank you again. It was. A real pleasure to see you and have you uh, present this accessibility topic today. And uh, everybody, I will see you next time. Bye-bye.